So good morning, Rinpoche. Good morning. And welcome to this uh, conversation where you're going to tell us about your series of books entitled An Odd Boy, volumes one to four. Uh, I wondered if you could start by telling us what gave you the, the idea to write your autobiography. Well, I suppose, first of all, it's not an autobiography. Um, it's uh, memoirs. More than that, it's, it's a monothematic memoir. It only deals with the arts. Um, and basically, I had no idea to write such a thing. Hmm. Uh, it came out of nowhere, really. Um, various students had asked me if I would write such a thing. And I always said, no, uh, I don't think I'll ever do that. I have nothing to say about myself. And then, sort of eight volumes later, <laughs> there appears to be quite a lot. Uh, it happened because Shadrol asked me if I would write about the poetry and the song that was on the website. I'd written a couple of songs, they were there, and some of my poetry was there. So she wanted me to introduce it. I'm sure she had in mind about a hundred words at most. Um, I started writing, and um, before I knew where I was, I had over 50,000 words on poetry and over 50,000 words on song, music, and both these um, merged into painting, into sculpture, into all kinds of things to do with the arts. Um, I realized that I'd written far too much and that these things were not useful anyway for the website because no one would read them. Um, we then, um, I then thought of combining them into one piece of work because we had some sessions where they were read to students and they seemed to enjoy them. And so I thought, well, it'd be quite nice if we put it all together. And then Zatzal had an idea of actually making them into a book and so she then took on the monumental task of taking this huge cauldron of material and putting it in a timeline because it was absolutely uh, sporadically written just here and there with stories, with accounts of you know, different things happening. Uh, and so while she was working on that, she would then ask me questions as well, what happened then, what led to this? And um, so she created all the segue by asking me questions and that's how the thing developed. And turning, it turned from one book then into four books. And where did the, the title An Odd Boy, when did that come in? And that happened around the same time uh, where, um, I had a friend who was a doctor and it was a particular time when um, your medical records were being made available and you mm. could have access to them. You, you could never have access to them before. So uh, he asked me if I'd like to take a look at them and th there wasn't actually much there, just a few pieces of paper, but one of them is now the cover of volume one of An Odd Boy. And it was just a medical record that goes back to when I was five. And it just has this An Odd Boy <laughs> written by Dr. Page in about 1959, I, uh, sometime like that, when I was about five years old. Mm. No, that'd be seven, must. Well, I, I'm no good at arithmetic, but anyway, um, mid 50s sometime. and. Um, so I thought, well, that's an ideal title, really. It just, it's there for me. That's what somebody said. And so the title and the book cover happened at the same time. I just thought, I'll just use these medical notes. I had a photograph of myself at the time that I attached to the side of the medical notes with a paper clip, and then I photographed that, and that's the cover. Mm. And. Uh, so the title suggested itself. Do you remember the, the visit to Dr. Ch Dr. Page that uh, 
brought about that comment? No, there were probably several visits because um, I had various problems, such as they couldn't decide whether I was right or left-handed. Mm. And I'd had some, uh, some intelligence tests of one sort or another in which I did extremely badly <laughs> and um, because I've got an IQ of 66. Uh, so um, there were issues of what's the odd animal out? And I'd get five animals and I'd look at them all and I'd spend half an hour on this and say, well, the parrot, because it's a bird, the whale, because it's, it's a mammal that lives in the sea, and there's, then there's an eagle. And, I, and there was one that was supposed to be the obvious one out, but I couldn't determine which was supposed to be the odd one out. <laughs> and th that happened with a few subjects, like, you know, what's the odd shape out? I thought, well, I don't know, they're all different, aren't they? So I could never answer these questions. And the, I, I think he was interested in why I couldn't name mm. the one that was the odd one out when it ought to be obvious to the regular human being. It was never obvious to me, so maybe that's what it was. He, he could understand my logic as to why I couldn't determine them and why I could see them all as being the odd one out. Uh, so maybe that's why he called me an odd boy, because yeah. I couldn't work for what the odd one out was supposed to be. Yeah, I was just thinking that was um, great. Uh, odd. <laughs> and why, why did you uh, decide to write the, or to publish the Odd Boy series as Doc Togden rather than Nakba Chugyam? Well, because... Um, in 1971, when I met um, Dujra um one of the things that I said to him, uh, you know, he was asking about my life and, um, and what was going on. And I said, well, I was going to go to art school for a degree course, but I think I'll abandon that now and just work and keep coming back to Nepal. And he advised me against that. He said, no, you should really um, take your education forward because you'll need that in the future. Um, and he said, you know, besides which, art is very important for Zadriana. And so, you know, you should always maintain your connection with all the arts. And so that's a thing I've done. And um, Writing them as Doc Togden was a way of addressing a non-Buddhist audience with ideas that were fundamentally Buddhist, simply not overt. So I would, you know, discuss the arts and creativity, and uh, you know, for you know, for any Buddhist who looks at the book, it's obviously written by a Buddhist. You can see that, but it's not obvious. So I thought I'd just use the name Doc Togden. Uh, Doc is because of doctor. I have a doctorate uh, from uh, the Visva Bharati University of Shantiniketan in West Bengal. I got that through Chimmy Riggs and Rupeshe. It's on um, Tibetan Tantric psychology. And so that's why Doc and Togden's one of my names. Dujra um, Rinpoche uh, called me Ergen Togden. So I just used Togden as a surname. It's on my passport. So my passport says Dr. C. Togden, Dr. Chergian Togden. Uh, so it, that is also my name. It just sounds different. So that was the reason for that. Uh, so that, that sounds um, almost as if in terms of an intended audience that you, that you had an idea of writing for non-Buddhists as well. Was that... Yes, I was writing for artists, basically. Mm. I mean, it's difficult, you know, um, thinking that you're writing for an audience. Uh, you can only think of an audience. You don't know the audience, and so it has to be a guess. Uh, I suppose the audience for whom I was writing was really uh, our own students. 
they enjoyed reading it and so I wrote it and I just assumed the general public might be slightly similar uh, except s sans the Buddhism mm. uh, so that's why it came out like that but um, I always found that Buddhists were suspicious of the arts and artists were suspicious mm. of Eastern religions and there seemed to be a gulf there that I was trying to bridge that gulf. I, I should point out at this point that I entirely failed to do so. Um, it, it wasn't worthwhile to that end. Whether it ever will be, I don't know, but I don't think I interested any artist in Buddhism. Uh, and I've yet to, do, well, I think I'm doing better with introducing Buddhists to the mm. arts than I am the other way around, but, um, and who knows what will happen with it in the future, but uh, that was the intention anyway. Uh, I certainly think you, you are successful at introducing or interesting Buddhists in the arts, certainly with, within the Sangha. Can you, perhaps uh, it would be good if you could say something about that link between Buddhism and the arts. I mean, what is that link? Well, the link is there very much in Vajrayana uh, in terms of uh, one of the essential aspects of Vajrayana is the senses and the fields of the senses and how those link with the five elements, earth, water, fire, air and space. This is central to uh, all Vajrayana. And uh, so where you've got the senses and the fields of the senses, you have the arts. And if you look at uh, Vajrayana ceremony and ritual, it is the arts. There's painting, there's sculpture, there's music, there's poetry. Uh, for Tsokolo, there's food, there's incense. Uh, you know, you have all the sense fields there. Uh, you have dance. You know, there's nothing that's omitted. Now, in terms of... Um, Vajrayana ritual, you see it there in a codified form, but the arts aren't limited to, you know, chum as dance, you know, lama dance. It doesn't have to be that kind of dance. You know, there's no real distinction in terms of Dzogchen in particular between chum and ballet. Uh, you know, movement or choreographed movement is what it is and likewise any kind of music. And so the arts, as they're understood in the West, are really not divided from the Vajrayana arts. And it's important to see that they're connected. You know, It's not that one's sacred and the other is secular, although that's how it would usually be seen. But in terms of Dzogchen, there is not this sacred-secular divide. And so the experience that's obtainable through the, what you could call the secular arts is also entirely valid, which is why Dutra Rinpoche encouraged me to maintain my connection with the arts with which I had been engaged, which is largely poetry, painting and music. And, and there with uh, music, it was largely blues, although my uh, musical appreciation goes beyond that into music I can't play. I'm very fond of Bach, but um, other than that, as a musician, I'm a blues performer. So I shall ask about that in a moment, but I just wanted to go back and ask whether, whether that um, lack of division between the, the sacred and secular that you've mentioned there is would you say that in Vajrayana there's also a, a lack of division between the different arts? Because in the West we tend to compartmentalise um, the arts. Yes, yeah, that's, that's part of an interesting conversation I have had with a few students who are artists because um, artists often run into problems with how art is handled in the West you know, you're supposed to be one thing or another. Um, you can't be an artist in all fields. It's not really allowed. You're not taken seriously if you do that. Um, Captain Beefheart, for example, had had to give up 
being a musician in order to be taken seriously as a painter. Now, in a Vajrayana context, you wouldn't have that. It would make no sense. Uh, in terms of being a Tantrika, it makes sense to not necessarily deliberately explore all the arts because we all have our particular interests. I mean, I've touched on most of them. I created one sculpture of frogs when I was at art school and I enjoyed that. I've not looked at writing plays or making movies, although if I had the opportunity, I would be interested. But um, for me, it's been mainly, I suppose, mainly poetry is, is the thing uh, that I've maintained most. And then uh, music, uh, painting sometimes, and, and I do that still. But, um, so it's there, one of the important things is that all the arts are equal. There's no hierarchy of arts. Uh, in the West, um, we do talk about the culinary arts, <laughs> but we don't put them on par with uh, Rembrandt or uh, Salvador Dali or whatever. But in terms of Vajrayana, uh, the culinary arts are equal with all the other arts. Also, um, your perfume, making perfumes is what you smell. That's an art and that wouldn't be relegated to some idea of, um, I, I don't know how it's viewed in the West, but it's not viewed like painting or poetry. But from a Vajrayana point of view, all the arts are equal. We also, uh, and would that include the crafts from the Vajrayana? Because in, oh, in yes. the West, there's a big There's no art craft divide, it's all art. You know, if you create, it's art. And I, I sometimes think, um, particularly at this time, that there's more art going on in craft than there is in the field of art. Mm -hmm. There was a, some exhibition in New York that I didn't attend, but um, I heard about it. And it, you had to put Wellington boots on and wade through six inches of water to see the exhibits that, that were all equally tedious. Um, I, I've seen some horrible exhibitions it seems to be that arts become, in order to be taken seriously, it has to be political. You have to be making a political statement. Uh, I think Salvador Dali was expelled from the Surrealists because he wouldn't be political. And I think, well, what has politics necessarily got to do with art? You know, I mean, yes, if you want to, but it should be a personal choice, not a law. Um, so for craft, I, I think I've seen some beautiful uh, things with craft, real uh, skill and invention that has been t entirely lacking in what's supposed to be fine art. Where um, I, I won't mention names here, but uh, an artist once told me that he was no good at uh, uh, fingers and toes. I, I didn't reply to this um, uh, critically, but what I thought was, you can't draw, can you? <laughs> There's nothing different between a finger or a toe or a nose or an ear. If you, you can either draw or you can't. Um, and I think that maybe there are people who simply can't draw anymore. And, and so, you know, abstraction is then an excuse. I mean, if you look at Picasso's ab abstractions, yes, you can say, well, yes, there they are, they're abstractions, but he could draw. If you look at his drawings, he, he really was a draftsman. Uh, but I don't think that applies necessarily in all cases anymore. And, and I think if you can't depict what you see, then how do you know you're in control of the marks you're making? It's like uh, part of uh, writing poetry for me, uh, when I spoke with my English teacher about it, I think between the ages of about 
14 and 16. Um, he was an interesting man, extremely strict, uh, uh, but he had a sense of humor. And um, I used to try to catch him on his way to school and he was an immensely tall fellow. I mean, he must have been six foot six and like a bean pole and he had huge long legs and keeping up with him was difficult. He obviously didn't like being walked with that much, but I persisted. And I asked him questions, and then he, he gave me some um, out-of-hours tutoring on poetry. Um, not that he said he could help me with poetry, in particular in terms of creativity, but that if I wanted to be a poet, then I needed to learn how to write poetry. I had to learn to write in, you know, he, he got me working through different forms of meter, iambic pentameter, trochaic verse, all the different forms, all the different rhyming systems, sonnets, limericks, everything. You know, he said, you can't write free verse or beat poetry and think you're a poet just because you can write anything. He said, you, you really have to have the skill first. And when you can do that, when you can force your ideas into a set number of syllables that rhyme A, B, A, B, and you can do that, then you can throw it away. And that seems to be something that uh, comes to also with the practice of Buddhism, because there's a great deal of discipline before there's freedom. And that if you can't engage with that, discipline, then what is the freedom that you've got, you know? How is it arrived at? Is that like saying about that the, uh, you need the form there as well to be able to explore the, yeah. the emptiness mm -hmm. in terms of the arts, yeah. that um, mm. you have to have that. Sid, um, this, uh, it sounds like you're involvement with poetry was obviously from a from a very early age um, and I know that there's a, a volume of a first volume of your poetry being uh, published soon mm -hmm. or maybe even has been published um, yes we're just waiting to uh, receive the first copy it should be through any time this month mm. so that's ravings of a mild-mannered maniac, maniac. Yeah. Um, and it seems that po poetry and music, you're still very much involved in. You still mm. write poetry, don't you? Yes. You still play music. Um, so are they, are they the two arts that you've had most uh, continuing involvement with throughout your life? I think so, yes. I mean, it's, um, the arts with me tend to go in cycles. I've actually not written any poetry for three or four years. Uh, I, I think that's one of the useful things in terms of being, uh, uh, of being in the Lama role as the primary thing and whether I write poetry or not is irrelevant so I don't have to force myself to write poetry. Poetry seems to just happen and I'll go into a cycle of it where I might write half a dozen pieces and I might work on them quite continuously and then it comes to an end and I might not write again for a couple of years but then I go more into music it seems to be a music period at the moment uh, mm -hmm. and so it's nice because it doesn't have to be forced I often feel really sorry for uh, musicians particularly in the uh, you know, rock music arena where you have to bring out an album of a certain number of songs there's only this long you know it is and they've mm. all got to be new and different and i mean you know the baroque and, cl and classical composers weren't didn't have to work with that constraint you know you could get one theme and develop it into um a symphony you know i often think there are pieces of music i've heard and i think well what a shame that that was just three minutes mm. You could, that could be expanded, you know, that, um, I think Bob Dylan did that at least. He, I mean, a, a lot of his old material, uh, he had many verses. There, there was 
there was quite a lot mm. of it. Uh, and was uh, was Bob Dylan someone that uh, you would consider, or is Bob Dylan someone you consider as a, as an influence in terms of your exploring the arts? Or? Uh, Yes, although he came along a lot later. I mean, Bob Dylan, um, his uh, book Chronicles, Volume 1, I've been waiting for Volume 2, it, it never happened, but um, th it was that that gave me the idea that a monothematic memoir was possible, because that's what his is. His is not autobiographical either. You know, it's not a blow-by-blow -blow account of his life. It just mm. follows his music. And so it's got that one theme there. And so, th you know, that's why I, um, I think that came out at about the time we were knocking an odd boy into a book and I realized that I didn't have to fill in the gaps. Mm. There. I didn't have to talk about anything I didn't particularly want to talk about. It could just be the arts as a theme. That, that wove its way through. When you when you were talking about the, about um, the constrictions on artists if they're trying to uh, follow a particular directive to produce a certain number of songs or a certain length of songs, uh, it made me wonder if you could say something about the actual process of creativity and and what that. Um, how the, the creative process is viewed in Vajrayana? Well, basically, uh, creativity is that which arises from emptiness. There is emptiness which equates to there being no idea. Then an idea forms out of the accident of circumstances. This is particularly with poetry. Uh, how a piece of poetry usually happens for me is uh, something happens in the world or in my circumstances. Um, if at the same time something else happens, uh, somebody sings a song that I see a reflection in that between what just happened and something else that happened. Uh, it starts coalescing into something. And then when I'm describing it, it'll have references and those, and the more references there are, eventually it turns into a piece of poetry. Uh, so it's a little bit like making continual puns as to what relates to what words that sound like each other. And that's just multiplies. So it comes mm. out of nowhere. It's not that uh, I might think, oh, I need to write a piece of poetry. What will it be about? <laughs> that just never happens. They always happen uh, by themselves. Uh, Although there's maybe one exception, we're putting together at the moment with Rick Finney, who is an old student of Trungpa Rinpoche, a book of people's reminiscences about Trungpa Rinpoche, because I've been aware that um, a book like that was needed, because although there are books about him, they tend to be rather academic, which seems a pity. And uh, there's one piece of poetry I have in there that'll appear about Trungpa Rinpoche that I wrote um, about a dream I had, which was the night before he died. And then I heard he died the next day and I remembered the dream and this piece of poetry came out of it. And uh, Rick was saying, um, you know, perhaps you could write something else for the book. And it suddenly occurred to me that there could be another piece of poetry about him that would be based on the different costumes he wore mm. uh, as being the basis. So that's the closest I've ever come to constructing a piece of poetry of having an idea. I thought, well, I'm not sure what I'd write about. And then I thought, uh, I think I was looking at a picture of him at the time of him wearing a kilt. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, right, well, there's the kilt, there's the military uniform, there's the Japanese uniform, there's the, um, 
I've got some old pictures of Trump and Boucher in the hippie period where he was looking like a hippie and then him with his monk's robes on and so you've got in a sense the eight manifestations of Gurumpache there or it might be nine or it might be seven but anyway it's a, a number of appearances and to make something come out of that I haven't started work on it yet so I, I don't know quite how it's going to go mm. but but the the idea always comes from emptiness as oh, you said the initial comes from nowhere whether you know. it's a a sandwich or a piece of yeah. poetry or but in terms of Bob Dylan being an influence he, he was only I only started liking Bob Dylan in my 30s or 40s I was never that interested in him at the time I don't think because I was more interested in blues but then I uh, I was not so interested in folk music back then and I think I had him pigeonholed in the folk music bracket and uh, at the time, um, in Britain at least, there was uh, a big um, um, divide going on. Uh, there was a lot of folk music purism going on. And um, some of those people uh, regarded blues as pop music because it was electric. If it was electric, it had to be pop music. Mm. And I was maintained, well, blue, you, your blues is not pop music. It may be electric, it's just electric folk music. You know, music, uh, folk music is music played by folk. And I think those black folks were folk, you know, <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't pop musicians. You know, Muddy Waters uh, worked as a sharecropper in Mississippi and he came up to Chicago and he just picked up an electric guitar and went from there, and so it was just another instrument. So, so I think that because of that, I hadn't really listened to him that seriously before then. So I really picked up on him uh, from his electric phase onwards. And then I listened to the old things, of course, and I enjoyed those, and I enjoyed his lyrics. Uh, also, Leonard Cohen, I think those are the two that stand out for me as really uh, you know, doing something highly creative with lyrics. They were both great lyricists. And what about the your earlier influences in terms of the arts then? I mean, you, you mentioned Muddy Waters, but who else? Um, well, the influences go right back to when I was about five years old, and I think they relate to... Um, the parents of friends. I was very lucky. My first lady friend uh, when I was five, Alice, uh, her parents were, I'm not sure quite how to describe them. They weren't bohemians, but they had a touch of that about them. I think he was an architect, maybe. They were fairly well off, but they were highly educated people. And Alice was, uh, Alice, you know, called them by their first names, which was a fashion then amongst mm -hmm. people of that kind. They were vegetarian and they were atheist. Mm. And so th this was really interesting to me as a five-year-old because I didn't know you could be an atheist. I thought it was illegal or something, mm. you know. I, I didn't, I, and it was just fascinating to me because um, I was not frightfully keen on God because he smote people. He, he seemed to smite anyone interesting and there was a lot of smiting going on. There's a whole um, section that I've got in Goodbye Forever uh, where I've compiled all the smiting that ever went on and, and just strung it all together. It, it, it makes quite a comical piece <laughs> and it was, uh, it, it, it's not intended to uh, ridicule Christianity but it's it's intended to uh, portray a picture of how I saw it at the time. It was a, a heavy-handed affair where, where punishment was the order of the day, which I think I got from, from those authorities around me who presented it in that way. Um, why am I talking about this? Um, I asked about your influences. Oh, yes, Alice's yes, parents right. So, so 
So I decided I was an atheist uh, at that point, and uh, I couldn't be a vegetarian because that wasn't allowed at home, um, so it, it didn't go that far. But, um, but she, uh, Alice painted, and she wrote poems, and she was uh, learning piano, and I mean, it was just a, an amazing environment where I thought, well, all this is possible, you know, you can do these things. So it, it seemed to me that, you know, you know, to be a real mensch, you know, to be a real human being, you had to be an artist. That was the thing to be, it was important. Uh, then they moved away to Herefordshire. Uh, I love that word, Herefordshire. It's impossible for Americans to pronounce it. Uh, Chatro is the worst at it. She says, Harry, je, da. Herefordshire is a lot of humor about that. Um, so mm. then there was Steve Bruce. Uh, his parents weren't quite as avant garde as, uh, as Alice's parents, but they were certainly artistic uh, musically. Um, he was a a police superintendent, but he was also a jazz musician, and he mm. had a, a, a band that was called the Dixons, which, if that's not amusing to people, I'll have to explain why it is. There was a, a television series called Dixon of Doc Green, which was about a local policeman who would always start saying, evening, oh, and he'd introduce what was happening and, um, you know, flex his legs like <laughs> Whenever you wanted to imitate a policeman, then you imitated Dixon of Doc Green, flexed your legs and said, even you know. Um, and of course, what they played was, was Dixieland jazz, so mm. calling themselves the Dixons. And um, the reason I'm talking about this is because it struck me as interesting that you could have a, a serious musical band whose name was a joke and it was a creative joke because they were they were all policemen apart from one who was an accountant but who was Mr. Bruce's brother but the rest were all policemen and so they called themselves the Dixons and they played Dixieland jazz that was a play on the word and it was maybe because I was interested in poetry anyway that I, I, I picked up on things like that. And I thought, oh, you know, you can play with language and you can make associations. So with that name, there were, you know, three associations going on in it. Mm. And um, so Steve's mother was more interested in um, classical music, uh, particularly Chopin. And uh, so I, I, I heard a lot of that. And Steve was, um, had um, guitar lessons from a very early age. And he, was, he, he became the uh, uh, bass player for Savage Cabbage. And um, so that was a highly musical time. Their house was full of books. Um, Steve had um, glandular fever at a certain age and was off school for a year. And uh, so he did little else but lie in bed reading books. Mm. So he was uh, highly literate and had a huge vocabulary, as you can imagine, from just reading a lot. I mean, at the age of eight, he was reading you know, Guy de Maupassant. Uh, mm. So, um, you know, he knew a lot about the world in that way. He was also born in September. So he was almost a year, a school year older than me, even within the same school year, but he was actually a school year above me. But uh, as he'd had the year out, he, he went back where he was. So he was uh, considerably older than I was in, in that way. Mm. And so he, um, it was his point of view that anyone who didn't read was an idiot. And this was highly influential. Not, not that I took much persuading, but he was a big influence that you had to read and read as widely and as much as possible. Mm. So all, all, all of those were quite strong influences on me as being, you know, if you wanted to have a good and meaningful life, you involved yourself with the arts. There wasn't really much choice about it. And were there 
particular artists that influenced you early on? Uh, I think particularly, um, I think some of the Renaissance artists I, I really like, particularly Albrecht Dürer. Mm. I found him fascinating, uh, particularly his um, painting of a small patch of scrub of weeds and mm. bits of grass. Um, it's a beautiful painting, uh, but what's unusual about it um, is that uh, people who don't know it, I ask them, when do you think this was painted? And they look at it and say, well, I don't know, any time from the 1960s onwards. Mm. And I say, well, we'll try the 1500s, you know, because at that time, the subject matter he chose was not beautiful. Mm. Nobody would paint a thing like that because it was not beautiful. It was just bits of grass and weed and what you painted had to be idealized in some way. And that's really not what he did. His other thing that always re I found remarkable was his rhinoceros, because he'd never seen one. Mm. He'd only heard them described, and so he created this thing from, from descriptions. And that, that rhinoceros of his has been so influential that someone has actually made a sculpture of it and turned it into a 3D form. Uh, so it's obviously capture, it, it captures people's imagination even mm. now, the, the, what he put into it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wonderful. So Albrecht Dürer, uh, the Surrealists in, particularly, in particular, uh, René Magritte is uh, probably my favourite. I also like Dali, but I think Magritte is my favourite. Max Ernst too, I like. And what about in terms of uh, poetry? Uh, poetry, uh, well, it goes back uh, to, I suppose, Chaucer, Shakespeare. Mm. Uh, I'm very fond of Shakespeare. Um, uh, not so much of what happens in between. I quite like Tennyson. Uh, mm. Wordsworth, I don't like particularly much at all. Um, um, Ted Hughes, I, I like. Um, a lot of modern poetry has become a little bit too political <laughs> and I've, I'm not so interested in, in, um, in, in the overt message of that kind. I'm more interested in um, natural perception rather than uh, politicking. And music, early musical influences? Oh, all of it. I, I would be very hard to say. Um, uh, Baroque, I think, uh, is been very important. Bach, <coughs> Buxtehude, um, Scarlatti, uh, or, you know, or almost everyone from that period. Classical also, but not as much as Baroque. I, I, I really like counterpoint. Mm. And of course, counterpoint comes through also, uh, interestingly, into blues but maybe only with Cream and Jack Bruce because he was classically trained and um, uh, the interesting thing about Jack Bruce was that he was a jazz musician and so playing blues with him, that's where these long improvisations came from. Uh, the long improvisations have become a thing that people find entirely tedious now because of course people, it depends how you play them uh, what he was doing with Eric Clapton was playing in counterpoint, but spontaneous counterpoint. And so their long improvisations were actually extremely interesting. You can really follow them. And if you like Bach, you can actually hear that going on. You can hear him occasionally coming out with a Bach-like phrase, you know, behind Eric Clapton. If you're only listening to the lead, you miss it. But if you listen to the bass, it's really quite wonderful. And so Savage Cabbage, our blues band, was uh, 
was very much in that direction. We weren't derivative in particular, but we were um, looking at where it could go with counterpoint in that way. Mm, fascinating. You mentioned uh, Goodbye Forever uh, some minutes ago, and I realised that perhaps anyone listening to this might not uh, know what you were referring to there, because that's uh, another autobiographical in nature, would you call it, a yeah. series of books? Well, it's another monosomatic memoir um, that again happened by accident. I never intended to write that either. Um, as I was writing An Odd Boy, um, it was being read to students and um, David Chapman uh, commented, I think he, he read a lot of it out and um, he gave me some advice um, which he called killing the kittens. The kittens are the bits of the book you really love but actually just get in the way of the story. <laughs> and uh, I could see the sense of this but um, I removed the kittens, I didn't kill them, I put them into cryogenic suspension and they just sat on my hard drive and because I, I'm, I'm miserly about what I write, I don't get rid of any of it. Um, the idea of scrapping a piece of writing that I put work into, I, I don't like to do that. So it sat there and when we'd finished with the four volumes of An Odd Boy, I was wondering what to do with this material and I was sitting together with Norton and Erdin one evening just going over the final draft and, um, and thinking, you know, uh, as movies sometimes have uh, an extra bit, you know, when you get the DVD at the end there's deleted scenes. I thought we could bring out a fifth volume called Deleted Scenes <laughs> and use these pieces up. So that was an idea for a short period of time to have a book called Deleted Scenes and of course some of these were Buddhist in nature that came from the original pieces of writing for the website. Mm -hmm. This was before it was a monothematic memoir on the art so those bits had to be taken out because there was no introduction to them as part of the flow, so I had to lose those, and I didn't really want to lose them because some of them were quite interesting. So uh, I went from there to thinking, well, let's not do that. Let's just take this theme backwards and start again um, from roughly the same point as an odd boy and write a parallel series. Uh, it's not entirely parallel because it, it, it's not one event linked with another, but the covers roughly the same time span and just look at the Buddhist theme and so that's where uh, those books come from. Although why goodbye forever I have no idea, I was just thinking how did that name arise and uh, I can't remember the point in time when I thought of that title. Mm. It's, um, I think if you, if if you read them, if you look at my history, um, Goodbye Forever is something that just happens all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, friends die, circumstances change, uh, it's, it's one long series of truncations of all kinds of things. So it was maybe from that, but I can't. I, I did think at one point that I changed the title, Kundra Deja and I talked about it, because uh, it seemed somewhat stark and gloomy as a title. Mm. I just couldn't think of a better title. Mm. I thought about it for about a month and we, we had all sorts of ideas, but none of them worked, so we went back to Goodbye Forever. So now you've got the, the four volumes of An Odd Boy, which are these memoirs mm -hmm. from the perspective of the arts, yeah. and then the series of Goodbye Forever, from the perspective of more of a Buddhist yeah. perspective. The and is that also a series as well, yes. Goodbye Forever? Yeah, I mean, there'll be four volumes of it again. Mm. Um, 
the arts come into it a little bit because there were sections of Savage Cabbage that got left out of the Nord Boy that are in there that it seemed that um, they were useful as part of the development uh, because there wasn't much to say about Buddhist involvement during the teenage years apart from the fact that I was reading books. Mm. And it's not really possible to write a book about sitting in my bedroom reading books. <laughs> it's not very interesting. So um, I would have, you know, discussions with Steve sometimes. He'd ask me questions about Buddhism and that would move backwards and forwards. So there are certain, you know, you know chapters where we have, you know, discussions. Um, and uh, I think there's one whole chapter about you know, telling the truth, because he mm. had a, a, a difficulty at one point about the fact that at the age of 14, I was having a relationship with a 22-year-old Swiss au pair girl. And um, I think his father had asked him a question about whether I had a girlfriend. And he found himself stuck not knowing what to say because he didn't really want to go into that with his father. And that put him in a bit of an embarrassing situation. So he was talking to me about it and saying, you know, I really don't know what to do here because I don't like being, you know, you know, dishonest with my parents. And suddenly, and so then I, I have to say to him, well, you did ask me. I just told you, you know. Mm. Um, and, you know, he may never discuss the subject again, you know. But anyway, uh, so we, we then get into a whole thing about what being a Buddhist means with honesty and, you know, one of the precepts, you're not supposed to lie. And so I said, well, you know, it depends how, how you work with that, you know, that um, it's basically, um, it's not lying itself that's the problem, it's why you're doing it. If you're, if you're doing it to gain advantage over another person, if you're doing it for some ends that's harmful, then that's a problem. But you know, if it's your aging auntie asking you what you think of her hat at the wedding, uh, and you're honest according to your own perception, and you say it makes you look like a fool. You know, this is not actually kind. So you lie and you say it's beautiful. What a wonderful hat. Yeah. So it's not actually honesty or dishonesty, but what your motivation is, whether it's positive or negative motivation. And so we have this conversation. And uh, I mean, we actually did have that conversation back at the time. And so, you know, it's quite useful to bring those things into the whole account. That, that, uh, that does bring me to ask something I uh, wanted to ask you about, actually, in terms of conversation, because there's a lot of dialogue in both the Odd Boy series and in Goodbye Forever. And I was wondering, I mean, are, there, are those specific conversations that you remember exactly, or it seems like a huge amount to have in your memory in terms of conversation? Well, there are various things I can say about that. Um, one is that um, every human being who, who uh, who I've ever asked this question of has said, yes, that has happened to me. You're sitting eating your breakfast one day or you're walking through town and you'll remember something exactly from your childhood. The exact words mm. somebody used to you, it'll just flash through and you'll remember that. So everything that's ever happened to you is, is, is there. You could remember anything. Now, that's not what happened, uh, although that is possible. Mm. Um, but if you, um, what I do with these conversations is that I think about the person, and um, when I'm thinking about them, I remember their, how they used to speak. Like you remember how someone looked then you mm. can remember how they speak. And then I construct the conversations from what I remember. I hear the voice, and when I'm writing down what Steve is speaking, 
um, I'm just remembering him and how he spoke. That doesn't mean that what I've constructed there is actually what he said, but it'll be very much like what he said. Um, I was only able to test this out once, which was quite fun, which was um, the oldest friend I have is uh, Lindsay Goulding, now Lindsay Berry. Uh, we reconnected some years ago and have been in contact since she came down and visited us and there was her husband. And she looked at all the uh, texts for an odd boy and uh, she was interested anyway. So I, I asked her to, I said, could you pay special attention to the section where you appear and, and what you say, because I'd like it to be, you know, uh, I'd like you, A, not to object, <laughs> mm. but if you do object, tell me, you know, what it is and how you'd like it changed. And so she read it and got back to me and she said, I, I, I find it hard to believe that you didn't have a tape recorder at the time. That, that sounds just like me. Mm. So I've got one example there of where I, I I obviously did that. I, I heard her voice in my head and I just wrote this stuff down. Uh, it doesn't mean that that is exactly what she said, but she said it sounded just like her. Mm. You know, that's how she spoke. So hopefully I've been able to do that with everyone in there. Mm. Um, I mean, going back to that creative process that you, uh, that you talked about at the beginning in terms of the creating on odd boy I mean the uh, Zatzal asking you questions and putting it into some chronological order um, did you find that as as she asked those questions and as you were writing things that more things came to mind I mean did more memories come back oh, as you absolutely wrote? yes I mean you know people are always, uh, always saying how can you remember all that stuff and I said well anyone can um, all you have to do to remember all that stuff is to start writing. Mm. When you start writing, you remember things. Then you write more and you remember more things. You write more. Uh, what has happened to me now is that I don't remember what I wrote in An Odd Boy as well as when I was writing. So if I go mm. back and look at the books now, oh, right, yes, that happened. And it's already faded because it's not in my present mind to be writing about it. So that's, that's interesting. It's not that I wrote it all down and now I remember it as if I'd written the book yesterday. I mean, it's drifted into the past now. That sounds like uh, it must be a very immersive process when it's happening in terms of, you know, you must have it all a bit like your living it very much when you're writing it. Yeah, I think in the introduction, um, when I'm uh, thanking Kundradation for her help with the book and, and going through the bizarre experience of having a husband who was living on planet Oddboy for a number of years, because <laughs> it, it, it was it, incredibly immersive like that. And um, I mean, I, anyone could write a book like that if they were creative and it's it, you know it's you know it's not that you have to consider that your life is important in some way or that i'm writing this book because i'm an important person and so i i, I mean anyone can do this uh, what makes it interesting is the fact that you find life interesting. Mm. And if you've enjoyed your life, that doesn't mean it's, it's had to be fun all the way through, because there can be tragedy in there as well. There certainly is some tragedy. Uh, but it's whether you appreciate the texture of it. And if you do, then you can express that and you can enjoy expressing that and express it in a way that other people might enjoy it as well. And then anything that tr anything tragic that happens can then be beneficial for other people in terms of how you coped with it, what you did with it. You know, that, um, 
Would you say something ab about appreciation? I mean, appreciation in the arts, but appreciation and in terms of Buddhism and Vajrayana as well as it? Yeah, I think that um, appreciation is, is a word that you don't hear used that much. Um, I use it a lot because in terms of Vajrayana, uh, everyone's familiar who looks at Buddhism with the word compassion. Uh, and compassion or uh, chantrupsem or in Sanskrit bodhicitta is a, is, an, is a word that's not understood very well because it doesn't actually translate as compassion. Compassion is an approximation. Uh, Trungpa Rinpoche called it active compassion. He qualified it um, mm -hmm. because what's meant in the West by the word compassion is closer to wisdom. You know, it's not something that deals with any sort of action that you take, but your know, chantrupsem, um, the word bodhisattva in, I, I don't, I've never studied Sanskrit, so I don't know, but uh, chantrupsempa, the pa on the end, uh, which is often person, where it's spelled P-A, in this it's spelled D-P-A achung, and, and that is uh, short for power or palm or hero. So mm. this is, you know, Changchub Sem uh, is the, you know, um, realized mind and the hero of realized mind. So where there's heroism, there's action. Um, so with Vajrayana, uh, compassion spreads out into appreciation and is undivided from desire, from lust. These things are not separate. So there's no problem with desire. It's if you have no desire, you have no compassion. Mm. It depends what the desire, what, what you do with it. Desiring things is not a problem in itself. It's whether it obsesses you or not, or whether you can desire on behalf of others. You know, I want you to have what you want. You know, um, I think people are familiar with that with children. You know, we want our children to have mm. what they want, and we're delighted when they're delighted. Uh, but you can do that as an adult. You can do it with your friends just as well as with your children or with people you've never met. Um. And the, the arts uh, at their best explore that um, communicative quality of mm. compassion, do you think? Yeah, well, I, I think any art that is worthwhile is art that makes other people's lives worthwhile, which is why I'm, I, I don't really like art that's based on misery. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's cheap. I, I, people are going to hate me for this, but um, I really feel that choosing a subject that is miserable about abuse. Um, I won't give descriptions of it because the artists uh, would be recognizable, but to pick a subject of people who are abused and mistreated and to turn it into art is really quite cheap because it's got a charge that doesn't come from you, the charge that's just coming from the h horrible nature of the situation. And then, you know, now it's, you know, if you want a prize for your book, it's got to have a miserable ending. Because a happy ending is a cliche. Now, what I'm wondering is how long the miserable endings go on in history before they're a cliche, if they're not already a cliche. And to write a book with a happy ending has now got to be novel, mm -hmm. interesting. Whoa, a happy ending. Who'd ever thought of doing that in a book, you know? Mm -hmm. The hero or heroine survives. Uh, you just don't get that, uh, which is as trite as, uh, as the 
happy ending that has to happen in some way. But I, I think literature ought to be um, something that is helpful to people. Oh, you know, sure, you have your hero or heroine you know, go through some terrible times, but they need to survive because you need to, the reader needs to know that he or she can survive. Not they read the book and think, well, where's the gun? I might as well blow my brains out now. I mean, this is, this is no service to anybody. You know, so uh, art ought to be um, something that, that supports, well, that supports heroism, that supports a kindliness, that supports uh, being able to be creative in your life, being able to succeed if you work hard enough. I tend to be a bit moralistic about that. And, and uh, art that doesn't do that, I don't have any respect for it. Art that tells you, uh, you know, the sewer is where you're bound, boy. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't approve of that. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not a place for uh, sadness and tragedy, as you say. I mean, there's some beautiful music that's. Um, melancholy in nature isn't there and there's I, yeah you know i i was i heard this on the radio the other day and i was thinking um a lot of that is socially conditioned um mm. for example you know what is melancholy about the minor chord um I don't necessarily, I think that's societal indoctrination that mm. minor chord is melancholy. I don't think it necessarily is. I think that's something we put on it. And um, this is a big misunderstanding of blues. And uh, I'm glad that at least one blues performer has actually spoken on this uh, um, buddy guy said you know uh, you know blues is not about misery it can be but that you know blues and the blues are, are two different things there's a considerable amount of blues that's quite jolly and even when it's not you can enjoy singing it uh, the first time this occurred to me i was on my motorbike Riding along, singing, I got mean things, I got mean things on my mind. And I thought, no, I actually haven't got anything mean on my mind at all, but I'm actually enjoying singing those words. Mm. And that uh, I, I can sing them with a, a sense of um, involvement without meaning them at all. They're, they're sounds. I, and I think that's really quite important that um, one's able to make that distinction. Um, I think the, the melancholy in music often comes from the words, not mm. from not from the actual music. That you can hear some really beautiful piece of music that you would say, "Well, well, that's a tragic piece of music, but I think that's an imposition on it. it it's not necessary, uh, unless the language that, that, that goes with it is telling you that. Yes, I can see that. There's the, the difference between uh, how uh, certain chords and styles of music are perceived in different cultures, isn't that? So it's clearly a conditioned... Yeah, I can see that. So. Uh, probably leads me to just ask finally I wanted to ask um, I think you've kind of answered it but um, what what would you hope from an odd boy series in terms of what somebody might get from reading it um, well I think that th the main thing that I would want people to get, and it's a thing I say quite often, is that everyone is an artist. Hmm. And that to be an artist, you don't have to make a living at being an artist. Uh, you can be an artist in the way you decorate your home. 
in what you wear, in how you speak. Um, one of my great ambitions is to speak good English before I die. I haven't got there yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, <laughs> so you can perfect your speech. You can be an artist in how you speak, how you dress, uh, how you arrange your furniture. It's all art. Uh, you could take it uh, in a more obvious direction and actually create paintings or drawings or sculptures or write poetry. Uh, you could do that, but it, it needn't actually go there. It, it can be in how you cook, how you present meals, how you, how you do anything. You know, your social choreography, who you invite to dinner, who, you, who the different people you get together around the table, it's all creativity. And so there's no reason for anyone to consider that they're not an artist. From that point of view, that's what I'd like people to get out of it. I'd also like them to get the idea that this whole thing in an odd boy is, is Buddhist inspired. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, and so there's potential there for, for anyone who wants to explore. It's not, uh, I, I should hasten to say that I'm not being evangelical about mm -hmm. this. I'm not interested in converting people to Buddhism in particular, but um, if one doesn't have a religion, uh, I, I, I think it's worthwhile having a religion. And if you haven't got one, well, here's one. Uh, and <laughs> it, this might be interesting, particularly for artists, uh, because I think that art is, has become a little bit um, I think art has become a bit lost. It doesn't know where it's going. People don't know what they're doing with it anymore. Um, I think to be creative as a person who's not religious is is tricky. You know, I think you need to be inspired by um, you know, uh, benefiting others mm. and having a sense of meaning in life. And if you haven't, uh, and you end up with, um, I think there are many things that occur with art that are completely trite. You know, like it's new and different. No one's done this before. No one's flooded the gallery to six inches and you have to walk around with gumboots in it. Uh, now it's been done, it can't be done again. What about hot coals, you know, and you have to wear an asbestos suit or something? It's, uh, that's actually trite. You know, just because it's never been done before doesn't mean it's good, you know. Um, I guess the artist has never committed suicide on the first night of the exhibition. Oh, that's, that's good. I'll do that. I'll shoot myself. You know, that's new and different. Uh, so new and different is, is a bit of a problem, this shock of the new business. Um, uh, one thing I heard over the last couple of years is that there's been a new... Uh, impetus in music away from that where people are actually able to say I'm a baroque composer I'm a new baroque composer I'm going to compose new music in, in baroque style or in classical style mm -hmm. or romantic style or, or whatever style or and you know the same could happen with art you could be a surrealist you could be a, 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 a pre-raphaelite uh, whatever, and that it doesn't always have to be new, because there's nothing particularly wonderful about new. You know, new has to be good as well as new, mm. uh, and, and different has to be good as well as different. You know, it could be the same. It doesn't really matter. What what matters is someone's creativity, and the effort they've put into a thing. And so I think what what makes a person an artist is their choice. You know, if you want to paint your wall a certain color and it's not on the chart, what do you do about that? 
do you accept the nearest color or do you explore other color ranges by other manufacturers and what happens if it's not there either they will allow you uh, at your own risk to put in an extra blob of blue into your green paint they say mm -hmm. you can't return it but you can do that it's not forbidden mm. uh, you can do all kinds of things i mean we've got uh, at the bottom of our house uh, and the bottom of everyone's house there's a sort of a black strip uh, I don't know why it's there, but the, on the outside of the house. The outside, you know, and uh, and I I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if rather than black, that that was grey, like the paving slabs. At the moment, it's grey. I don't like that either because it's it's not the same grey as the paving slabs. So the next time we get it painted, I'm going to put a bit of yellow into the grey and see if I can get the grey to match the paving stones in its colour. Mm. Now, uh, you don't have to do that. It's extra work, and why? Well, but why? Because I think it would look nice to do that. I'd enjoy seeing it. So uh, what makes you an artist is actually um, putting more effort in that's necessary. I think that's really important. Then you become an artist, and then you make more of those choices. And then that becomes influential because people observe your choices and then they recognize that they can make those choices too. It's like, you know, what you wear. Um, you wear it out on the street, people see it, they think, oh, look at that. That's interesting. I'd never thought of doing that. Um, some people just laugh, of course. I get laughed at quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there, there was a period of time when um, people in Penarth used to whistle some snatch of the good, the bad and the ugly when I went by with my western hat on. And uh, it stopped now. One young man came up to me and said, Howdy cowboy. And I said, Greetings sheep farmer. <laughs> <laughs> and no. No one said a word since <laughs> then. <laughs> I, I couldn't quite resist that. It was rather naughty of me, but uh, <laughs> it was kind of amusing. But um, yeah, laughing about what is different is 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 really um, uh, a sort of primitive mentality. One should be intrigued by difference uh, and educated by it. And so, you know, all those things are things that get explored in An Odd Boy and also in um, Goodbye Forever because the two, cr you know, cross over. I can't stop them crossing over into each other. So there's art mentioned there. And um, the whole question of um, uh, being free to... Yes just being free not not following a set of you know conditioned rules to anything having to actually understand what you're doing i mean i remember that um when i was first in india it's one of the things i talk about there that um it seems that every western person i met had decided the west was a terrible place there was nothing of value at all in the West. The music was rubbish, everything was rubbish, and so they were going to become born-again Tibetans. Mm. And uh, it was real fun to not have toilet paper, and it was real fun to eat with your fingers. I, I don't particularly like eating with my fingers. Uh, I'd much rather use a Western toilet um, but these things were, were not respected by people around me. And I thought, well, I don't really think that I want to just fall in with this mindset here. Mm. Just because I'm interested in Buddhism, it doesn't mean this, that, and the other. You know, there's not a package that I have to buy 
that is outside Buddhism that you buy the Buddhism and you have to have this other thing that goes along with it um, now funnily enough years later I was at this uh, uh, Western Buddhist conference and some of the same people were there who were there back in the early days the early 70s in India and from being people who bought the package they were now rejecting the package and talking about all the wonderful things the West had to offer and I thought this is very interesting because I've not actually changed mm. um, I liked the things the West had to offer back then and uh, but now I, I'm not rejecting the parts of Buddhism they're rejecting so from being some aberrant person I've become an aberrant person just a different kind of aberrant person although I haven't changed so I still like all the music I used to like but I'm not rejecting parts of Buddhism because they don't fit with psychotherapy so people seem to follow the fashion and following fashion is deadly you know it's it's of course the complex thing about that is that it's equally problematic to reject fashion mm -hmm. if there's something that is fashionable that I happen to like then I like it because I like it not because it's fashionable um, so I, I don't reject everything that comes up but I, I, I look at it and say well what do I think about that I've got a pair of um, steampunk cufflinks I didn't mm. know they were steampunk I didn't know they were trendy I just saw them and I thought oh I like those but they're sort of parts of a watch mm. and they have little mechanisms in them and I thought I like those uh, but most people like what they like because they're obeying orders <laughs> obeying the orders of fashion and whether they you know this is why people will look at old photographs of themselves and find them embarrassing because they're wearing something that's now embarrassing and you think well you never really liked it at the time did you you were actually just following a fashion which is now you're embarrassed about the fashion if you'd authentically liked it you'd still like it so um, I've got all kinds of things that I used to wear back in the 60s that I still wear I haven't actually changed I think there are more things I like now mm. but I still like what I liked back then I probably don't wear the flared trousers anymore just because you can't buy them but um, <laughs> but however uh, those those things are, are crucial getting people away from fashion in both art and religion that there was a, one of the most e amusing examples of not buying the package was uh, there was a San Francisco you know, gay shooting club that was called the Pink Pistols and the local council were trying to close them down and the NRA came to their defense these men are our brothers now the NRA the National uh, National Rifle Association are not known for being um, uh, pro-homosexuality in particular Let, let's put it that way um, you know these men are our brothers you know they're gay and the spokesman of the Pink Pistols said it's easier to tell other shooters I'm gay than tell other gays I'm a shooter and he said I did not buy the gay package where I'm anti-gun whether I shoot a gun or not has got nothing to do with my sexuality but I'm supposed to buy that package and when I heard that I thought that is very interesting because that's pretty much what occurred in the early days of going to India there was a package you were supposed to buy that wasn't just the thing it was what went around it and people don't have to buy the package people can decide what they're going to buy you know? and that's what makes you an artist that's what makes you an artist that's what appreciation is it's about not being a herd animal 
So perhaps uh, that would be something from somebody reading an odd boy series where they would be inspired to uh, leave the herd. And, and those who didn't enjoy this talk can wish I was an unheard animal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Rinpoche. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Very good.